Divorced, beheaded, and died. Divorced, beheaded, survived. I'm Henry VIII, I had six sorry wives. You could say I ruined their lives. If you've ever studied British history, you more than likely have heard all about King Henry VIII of the Tudor dynasty and his endless pursuit for love slash a male heir. Now, this is not to say he didn't do anything significant outside of his marriages, but let's face it, we're all just interested in the drama and the scandal. Escándalo. And what could be more scandalous than the ruler of a nation who was so desperate to solidify his dynasty that he changes nation's religion on the off chance that a new wife could provide him with a son? Or maybe that's not the whole story. We'll get to that later. Shh. Now, these stories have been told time and time again, from Shakespeare to Showtime. But as Henry is the common denominator between these women and, you know, the king... He's historically been the protagonist of these pieces of media, and his wives have, for the most part, been squished in the public conscience into one-dimensional stereotypes. Betrayed wife, temptress, good woman, ugly catfish, bad girl, and nurse. This is further exemplified by the popular rhyme describing their fates, but only insofar as to how their marriages with Henry went. However, interest in these ladies still exists as more and more portrayals try to break away from their original perception. Case in point. In case you haven't been keeping up with contemporary theater, Six is a British-born musical that's quickly hit peak popularity, from its humble beginnings at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival to spreading all over the world. This show retells the story of the six wives of Henry VIII as an ensemble piece. Through the format of a concert, each of them has their own solo, as they compete with one another over which one was the most screwed over by the king and should therefore be the lead singer of the band. Created by Cambridge University students Toby Marlowe and Lucy Moss, it was conceived through them wanting to create a musical that would play with the musical format and have a majority female cast. One of the show's main themes is that of addressing the public's perception of these women, both currently and in the past. As producer Andy Barnes puts it, the Tudor and Elizabethan ages are perfect places to start, because people are already have a little knowledge of them. This allows for the show to tackle the basic ideas that people have about these women and elaborate on them, showing they are more than just quote unquote one word in a stupid rhyme or a stereotype as conveniently laid out here by the creators themselves. Moss, who was studying feminist history at the time, has stated that their goal was to redress the historical wrongs that have been done to these women. However, does the show lean on the public's understanding of these ladies a bit too much in order to reach its goal? Moreover, whilst there is no definite way to know everything that really happened, and as the show itself states, does it succeed in addressing misconceptions about these queens, and does it truly portray the reality of their lives, as far as historians know, or is it just historical fan fiction? Let's find out and go through each queen's real life and compare it to their portrayal on the show. In the first part of this miniseries, we'll be looking at the first three wives, Catherine of Aragon, Anne Boleyn, and Jane Seymour. Let's go. Catherine of Aragon, the youngest surviving child between King Ferdinand II of Aragon and Queen Isabella I of Castile, was originally betrothed to Henry's brother, Arthur, but this marriage only lasted four months and was supposedly never consummated, as Arthur would soon pass away from an unknown ailment that both he and Catherine caught, though she survived it. His death would leave Catherine in a sort of limbo, where she would remain for seven years. Now, she wasn't literally imprisoned, but... She was all but that. With her father and Henry VII continually squabbling over whether she would marry the young Prince Henry or not. And this is all the while she's experiencing her own fair share of financial and personal issues, including the death of her mother. Against the wishes of his recently deceased father and Leviticus, which claimed that if a man shall take his brother's wife, it is an impurity. He hath uncovered his brother's nakedness. They shall be childless. The two would eventually marry. I shall be marrying the heir to the throne of England again. I mean, for the first time. Um, the other first time did not count. <laughs> Good time, sis. I mean, wife. Soon enough, however, the problem started. It is thought that Catherine had all in all three miscarriages, two sons who died soon after birth, and only one daughter who actually survived to childhood and beyond, Mary, who would grow up to be Mary I, aka Bloody Mary. Help them! For God's sake, help them! 
Unfortunately, a single child and a girl at that was not enough for Henry. It's not your fault. It's just that you came out the wrong sex and ruined everything. So grow a penis to get lost. Unsatisfied with his marriage, he had at least three mistresses whilst with Catherine, including Elizabeth Blunt, who had the only out of wedlock child that Henry would acknowledge as his own, as well as the next queen on this list, at the time one of Catherine's ladies in waiting, and her sister. So, the Boleyn whores. Henry finding his future brides-to-be amongst his current wives' ladies-in-waiting will be a recurring theme, and we'll explain further details about Henry and Anne Boleyn's relationship later on, but for now, let's continue focusing on Catherine. Henry's interest in other pursuits and impatience in wanting a male heir would lead him to suddenly coming to the conclusion that their marriage was not working because it was sinful in the eyes of God. How convenient for him to remember Leviticus now. Catherine, although she was a devout Catholic, was very much against the suggestion of being moved to a nunnery, even though it could have saved both her and Mary's high status, and insisted on continuing defending her honor as queen, even as the king moved his new girl into royal quarters. I need your answer, yes or no. No. I am the king of England. I can have what I want. No. Why won't you do this? No. Silence! No. The trial for the divorce, called the King's Great Matter, was obviously a big deal, and one of the highlights was Catherine kneeling to Henry in court, giving the speech of a lifetime, and storming out. But despite her continuous efforts against Henry's wishes, and the people of England, particularly the Roman Catholics, staying mostly in support of Catherine, and the Pope's insistence that the trial should be taken to his own court, Henry broke off from the Catholic Church, became supreme head of the Church of England, divorced Catherine, and got himself a new queen all in one fell swoop. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for him. Catherine would go from queen to Princess Dowager, be moved into increasingly more isolated places, and eventually pass away, likely from cancer, without having been able to contact her daughter allegedly unless both of them acknowledge Anne Boleyn as queen, a demand to which they both said, No way. <laughs> Catherine's portrayal on the show goes with what she's most famous for, being the spurned first wife. Her number, No Way, as the first solo in the show, is used almost as a proof of concept of the competition part of the musical, focusing on just laying out the many shitty things that Henry did to her, rather than laying out stuff that the public is unlikely to know about her. It's also a direct reference to that appeal I told you about. Her personality, style, and song are inspired by Beyonce, Beyonce. Which is fitting not only for her title of Queen Bee, but also for her being cheated on. Unfortunately, the show does omit a few very interesting details about Catherine, potentially to further fit her into the idea of being the betrayed wife. Yeah, she certainly seems to have fit the idea of a loyal and godly wife, but she was also, simply put, a competent and respectable queen. Firstly, she's considered Europe's first female ambassador, having represented the Aragonese kingdom in the English court in 1507. Secondly, although she seemed like a thorough traditionalist, the controversial book The Education of a Christian Woman, which argued that all women have the right to an education, was dedicated to and commissioned by her for the education of her daughter, which is pretty neat, even if her daughter didn't grow up to be very nice. Help them! For God's sake, help them! Lastly, she actually functioned as Queen Regent for six months in 1513, during which the English armies faced off against the Scots in the Battle of Flodden, and she was credited as giving an impassioned speech whilst heavily pregnant, giving the army a great morale boost that helped them achieve victory. Unfortunately, there is a lack of proof for this claim. Though some sources do say she at least had actively moved closer to where the fighting was happening by the time the British victory had been announced. During this time, she proved herself to be a strong leader and an ideal queen, an energy that the public really took to. As a whole, the show definitely uses the most egregious parts of what made her and Henry's relationship a mess, but since this is a song entirely about her divorce with Henry, it does leave out some very interesting factoids about Catherine of Aragon outside of her marriage, and somewhat simplifies her to what history already acknowledges her as. Oh, and finally, her color of choice in the show, yellow, was what Henry and Anne Boleyn wore after Catherine's death. She was once given the title of queen. Mistakenly. Though it's unclear as to whether this was meant as a display of celebration, or if it was meant for mourning, since some say it was the color of mourning in Spain at the time, though this claim seems to be somewhat unsubstantiated. It's called wearing yellow to a
Now, before we talk about Anne Boleyn, we need to clear a few things up. First off, at one point, Henry was such a staunch supporter of Catholicism versus Protestantism that he earned himself the title of Defender of the Faith. And now his Catholicism at this point was very much inspired by the fact that Catherine's family was number one, very Catholic, and number two, very powerful. So he obviously had to appeal to them. Number two, it's also very unlikely that Henry's shift away from Catholicism was entirely just for marriage purposes, since it also allowed him to take over the religious power in England and to sell the monastery's lands for an economic boost. <laughs> Now that we've got that out of the way, let's talk about Anne Boleyn, the Pamptoise. I spit up a lot, sorry. Anne, part of the respected Boleyn family, was raised in the French court alongside her sister Mary, where she acted as a maid of honor first to Mary Tudor, Henry's sister, and then to her stepdaughter, Claude of France, who Anne stayed with for seven years, learning the ins and outs of court life. Here is where she was potentially first introduced to religious reform, having been raised a Catholic herself. In due time, she'd be taken back to England to marry... not Henry at this point, but rather James Butler, her cousin. This union never came to be, potentially because of her father looking for a marriage of more importance for Anne. Be careful what you wish for, kids. <laughs> While Anne was part of Catherine's entourage, she caught the eye of many a man, especially that of poet Thomas Wyatt. But surprisingly, she was not the first person in her family to catch the eyes of the king, as her sister had had an affair with the big man himself previously, which may or may not have led to the children she had during her first marriage. Anne would, whilst in court, become entangled with Henry Percy, a match that would have likely worked out had it not been for the interference of Thomas Wolsey, Henry's Lord Chancellor, who supposedly got the match cancelled, likely following the King's orders. If true, this potentially marked the first sign of Henry's interest in Anne. By most accounts, their courtship lasted for a while, with some accounts stating that she outright refused him until he was able to annul his marriage, which would line up with the idea that he wrote the poem of yearning green sleeves for her. But this has been deemed unlikely, as it follows an Italian composition style that wouldn't reach England until after his death. After seven years of courtship, the two had a secret marriage, she became pregnant, they got married again, officially this time, and she finally got her crown. The public's reception of her as queen wasn't great, however. When she appeared in public, there was hooting and hissing, and some people called her the king's goggle-eyed since, as previously mentioned, there was a general preference for Catherine, potentially due to the Catholic Church portraying Anne quite negatively. Whether Anne actively pushed for the creation of the Church of England or not has been debated, but it's certainly a possibility, considering she had shown much interest in Reformation both in her time in France and in Henry's court, and how she later pushed for the protection of evangelicals as queen. Things seemed to be mostly looking up for Anne and Henry, with everyone expecting a baby boy on the way. Please be a boy, please be a boy. Oh no! Oh no. This was such a shock that an extra S had to be added to the proclamation celebrating the birth of a new prince, S. This baby would grow up to become the absolute British icon Elizabeth I, but at the time Henry was not happy. <laughs> Anne not conceiving a male heir would put her in extra danger once Catherine had passed. While her exact number of miscarriages is unknown, most sources believe that there were at least two, the second of which happened on the same day of Catherine's burial, potentially caused by her having witnessed Henry courting his would-be third wife, Jane Seymour, one of Anne's ladies-in-waiting. Like I said, it's a recurring theme. In an unsurprising move for him, Henry would soon put Anne on trial and move Seymour into royal quarters. <laughs> The charges laid against Anne? Adultery, incest, and high treason. These were likely absolute BS and just a means to an end, both for Henry, who had waited a whopping three years for a male heir and was fickle as all hell, and for Thomas Cromwell, his chief minister, who had consistently clashed against Anne on matters of foreign policy and church finances. Ultimately, it's not a certainty that Anne was sleeping around, and even then it's unlikely she had the seven affairs she was accused of, including one with her brother, George Boleyn. Also, let's not forget that Henry himself had at least two affairs during their marriage, with Jane Seymour and either Madge or Margaret Shelton. So obviously he didn't follow the standards he put his wives up against. What a surprise. Though there was little to no concrete evidence of her supposed crimes, Anne and five of the men, only one of which pled guilty, potentially after being tortured, were unanimously found guilty by the jury, which included both her uncle and her once fiancé. 
and reportedly faced her death with dignity. <laughs> giving a grand speech before her beheading. Hold up, let me tell you how it went down. Six's version of Anne absolutely milks her entrance, highlighting how she's arguably the one that history seems to be most curious about. This is unsurprising, of course, since public knowledge deems that it was her seduction of the king that shifted the course for British history towards Protestantism. Her character on the show is inspired by Lily Allen, taking on a mischievous persona with her bouncy solo, Don't Lose Your Head, which fits her reputation as the one who shook things up, things being the official religion of England. Her solo in the show describes the impulsive actions that she made, which led to her marriage and her subsequent beheading, including flirting around, which, while it's not necessarily historically accurate, is also up for debate. Once again, since this song is mostly about her relationship with Henry, it does admit a few very interesting facets of Anne's personality. Ironically enough, she was much like Catherine of Aragon, where they both defended religion, but Anne defended evangelicals instead of Catholics, and England's people, with Anne helping pass a law that would help those unemployed find jobs, and believing that the church's revenues should go towards charitable causes, instead of just the king's coffers. Anne will always be shrouded in mystery, probably being neither a saint nor a sinner, but if nothing else, Six shows how feisty she was. I wouldn't be such a if you could get it up. Oh, and also she probably didn't have an extra finger, as the men who said that literally never met her in person and had a vendetta against her daughter. At the maximum, she had an extra piece of fingernail. Jane Seymour was a lady-in-waiting to both of Henry's previous wives, having witnessed all the drama surrounding both these unions, but in due time his eyes would land on her. She wasn't as educated or as high-born as his previous wives, but that didn't seem to detract his interest in her. Potentially this just might be what attracted him to her, alongside her quiet demeanor. Her attitude, or lack thereof, is either a natural part of her personality or a facade to please the king, depending on who you ask. It's also possible that the Seymour family pushed for her and Henry getting together as a means to improve its standing. Either way, their courtship seems to have started before 1536, but she apparently rejected his initial advances. While Henry was moving on from Anne's miscarriages, he apparently sent Jane a bag of gold alongside a letter, which she demurely refused. Astoundingly, they married only 11 days after Anne's execution, though how Jane reacted to her death is, yet again, unknown. Whether it's the lack of drama that she was involved in, or the fact that her reign only lasted less than two years, there just isn't that much historical information about Jane. We don't really know that much about her, especially about her inner thoughts and feelings. Well, I never in all my life. Ma'am, ma'am? I came in here to find out something about Jane Seymour's personality and feelings. Well, I know you're upset and you're scared about this lack of information. But we just don't seem to have anything on Jane Seymour. I'm sorry. You know, I may not make it through next week. Their marriage seemed, as far as Henry's relationships go, decently healthy. Her actions during their union paint the picture of a peaceful woman. Having initiated the reconciliation between Henry and Mary, his first daughter, a painstaking process that required Mary to sign away her Catholic faith and agree that her mother's marriage with the king was unlawful. Jane was also quite conservative in her beliefs, having publicly sympathized with Catherine of Aragon after her death. And the one time she got into Henry's kingly duties was when, in face of the Pilgrimage of Grace, a Catholic rebellion against the Reformation, she begged Henry to restore the abbeys. In response, he reminded her of what had happened to the previous queen when she got all up in his business. <laughs> okay, maybe I'll take that whole decently healthy marriage thing back. Jane never got to have a proper coronation, as a plague was ravaging London at the time. On the bright side, she soon became pregnant, and in due time would be giving birth to Henry's only legitimate son, Edward. Many joyful celebrations would follow, and though the birth had taken two days and three nights, Jane seemed to have recovered. Unfortunately, her condition quickly worsened from there, and Jane would pass away only weeks after the birth. It is unknown if Henry was with her when she died. As the only of Henry's wives that died while still married to him, she would receive a queen's funeral, 
a grand event where Mary was the chief mourner. Henry was, by most accounts, never quite the same after her death. He would wear black for three months, which is quite a stark contrast to him wearing yellow after his first wife's death, and though dealings for finding a fourth wife would begin soon after her passing, he would only remarry two years later a surprisingly long time for Henry. He would still hold her dear for the rest of his life, likely for being the queen who gave him a son, and during his last marriage, a family painting of him, Shane, Edward, Elizabeth, and Mary would be commissioned either by him or his wife. Whether or not this painting was just propaganda for the Tudor dynasty, it certainly symbolized Henry's appreciation for Jane. After his death, he would be buried alongside Jane in Windsor Castle. Causes. <laughs> when will justice be served? Six kind of accepts that Jane's stories is just not as spicy as the others, so instead it focuses on the tragedy of her giving Henry what he wanted, but dying in the process. Her show self is inspired by Adele, if her art breaking ballad Heart of Stone didn't give that away, though her personality during the show isn't exactly very Adele ish. Is that piss in that cup? Don't fucking throw that at me. Her solo in the opening number hints at her being different to what the public perceives her as. But I'm not what I see, or am I? But the show never really goes beyond that, aside from asserting that she was stronger than she seemed. Her soft exterior, alongside her having seen how Henry dealt with his two previous wives, creates a good basis for her solo, where her gentleness is contrasted with how dutiful and dedicated she was, especially when it came to her household and her position as queen. Six's version of Jane kind of follows what the public already knows her as, which may not do much to subvert expectations, but it is, for the most part, historically accurate, as far as we know. Sure, there is still question as to why someone so peaceful would marry a man that threw his first two wives under the bus and onto a chopping block, respectively, but they're just that. Questions. They just don't know. Six's portrayal of Jane mostly focuses on what's interesting about her and Henry's relationship, and that yes, they seem to love each other, but it was still a very toxic relationship. In fact, her happy ending, shown in the musical's final number, seems to include having a big happy family with Henry. Whilst this is kind of an odd choice considering how the show is all about reclaiming history through a feminist lens, it provides some genuine nuance and contrast to how his other marriages were described. Six's portrayal of the first three wives mostly focuses on the public's perception of them, adding a little bit of extra depth. Catherine gets to show some attitude, Jane gets to show some nuance, and gets to not sleep with her brother. But the thing is that these songs still mostly focus on just their relationships with Henry rather than their own personal lives. Now, this is not necessarily a problem, but I wonder, will the next three wives change this? Let's see in part two. Ooh! <laughs> just before I go, yes, the ladies in the back of the stage playing instruments are actually named after the Queen's ladies in waitings. Waitings. We have Margaret Lee, John Mutas, Maria de Salinas, and Elizabeth Blunt. I didn't know how to fit them into this format, so I just had to shove them into the end. I'm so sorry. And I just wanted to say, on behalf of me and Jack, thank you so much for all the support we've received. Uh, we didn't expect Legally Blunt to take off as much as it did, but we're thankful for it. We're very excited to put out new content. I've got stuff underway. He's got stuff underway. We've got stuff underway. Just you wait. And I hope you have a good day slash evening slash night. And here's to part two, hopefully not taking as long as this one did. <laughs>